you said you wanted to go to Texas, but they didn't feel you was big enough to play the position. Um, so was it UT, A and M? Were that the, were those the only Texas schools that you were like considering? The Frogs, TCU. TCU. Okay, I loved them. Okay. Took a visit there and had a buddy from high school that was going to school there, and mm -hmm. I went there. I was like, damn, there's a lot of girls up here. And they party too, Johnny. And you they know party, they party. They, they, they party TCU. Almost every year, number one party school in the Go Frogs. I mean, damn, man, it was crazy. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was like, this place is heaven on earth. It's right. nice. It's clean. The girls, the football program. They're in a well, damn, Johnny, you don't mention nice and clean and talk about girls and you ain't got the football yet. I, at that point in time, I wasn't thinking about football, Shannon. I'm trying to go have a good time in college. Okay, okay. I wanted to be like this mix of like Entourage on HBO and like <laughs> Blue Mountain State and all these things I was watching at the time. And what I was ingrained in was just like, I'm a party boy. Right. I just happened to be good at football a right. little bit at that time. You know, my grind and focus and determination of the game didn't come in until I got into trouble before my... Heisman year at A&M, right. June of 2012. It all kind of came to a halt when I got arrested. And I got arrested for going out to Northgate and College Station and drinking too much and blacking out and waking up in handcuffs. And when that instance happened, it was this meeting with Coach Sumlin and my mom and my dad. And it was like, you either figure this out today or over the next couple weeks, your ass is out of here. You're gone. And then your everything you work for, your scholarship, everything. You figure it out now. As my family sits there in the room and someone's looking at him just like we're looking at each other right now, he's like, you guys figure it out. And when that happened, my family moved to College Station. Wow. And, they, and they moved in my backyard. And I pretty much moved back in with my mom and my dad. And that was the moment that was like, all right, you hear what's going on. You're smart enough to comprehend this. You may be fucking around with your boys and doing what you think you want to do, but the opportunity that's in front of you, you are spoiling and you need to get it together. And that's when George Whitfield came into my life. Mm -hmm. And I went, my mom sent me to San Diego with all the money they probably had saved up for their little saving stuff and sent me out there to work with this guy and they trusted him. And when I came back, I left before that trip and getting arrested fourth on the depth chart below the freshmen who came in, mm -hmm. below the two other guys that were above me in the class. And in 11 days when I got back and we started training camp, I was named the starter and handed the keys to the Texas A&M University football team. That's how much of a difference my focus and my passion and my energy being put into something turned out to be. If that situation, you drink into the point of blacking out, do you remember anything about that night other than going to the bar uh, with your homies? I was taking Xanax back then. Um, and it was a very like weird time in my life where I was dealing with anxiety mm -hmm. and all these things and emotions that were going on that I didn't have any you know, business being able to handle on my own. But from that country kid, proud and tough and all these things that I prided myself on, I wasn't asking for help. Right. Shannon, I didn't ask for help when I was sitting in Cleveland. Right. So why am I going to do it when I'm in college? Right. So I was a lost kid trying to figure out, like, you know, after my first year at A&M when I redshirted, at the end of that year, I said, fuck this. I'm done playing football. I was finding out how to transfer to TCU to play baseball. That's how bad it was after my redshirt year. Six and six, we're in the Big 12. I'm going to Ames, Iowa, and all these, like, that ain't the stadium that I wanted to be playing in. Right. And there's no disrespect to them whatsoever. The Big 12 is not the SEC. Right. And, and you you see it now. Only two of them schools in the Big 12 got into the SEC. Mm -hmm. Four, if you add Missouri and A&M. Only four, that whole thing, really got in. So there's a difference in program. There's a difference in stature of dudes. Any team can beat a team on a given day. Mm -hmm. But consistency of a program and legacy, you know, there's only a couple teams that got into the SEC for a reason. You graduated early in high school. 
enrolled in Texas a and Why did you feel you needed? Did you feel you needed to do that or you were just trying to get away from from your hometown? Like, man, I got to get up. If, as far as enrolling early? Yeah. I saw the greats doing it. I saw the good quarterbacks in every class were getting on campus early to figure it out. So I would say it's 50-50 on if I just wanted to get away from the fam and get my own car and be in my own apartment. Yeah. And I was, in a hu- I was in a hurry to grow up, yeah. which is what a lot of people do in life. And sitting back now, I realize that you should enjoy your time from yes. your 12 to your 16, 17 years old. And it's only getting worse with NIL and what's going on in the world. People are treating 13, 14 year old kids like brands and businesses and you know, you see all these kids or social media and they're trying to make money. Like the love of the game is not about that. And now we're at the point where in college you're getting exposure to millions and millions of dollars and it's taken away the passion and the love for what it truly is. Right. If you would have handed me a million dollars in in my freshman year when I got to AM, you'd have seen some shit. <laughs> And that's you might it. not have made your sophomore year, Johnny. I might not. I definitely wouldn't be sitting in New York with that trophy. I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you would have seen some shit for sure. When you uh, when you had your visit to Texas A&M and you walking around on campus and they normally have they pull out their best you know the the best ladies to show you around. They call them hostesses and they show you around and you walking around on campus and you look at it around. You like, yeah, I'm coming early. It's never about the girls for me back then, really, to the max. I've always been a guy that like rides for my dogs and I enjoy the time with my bros and just drinking and, you know, smoking or doing whatever. Like that was always what it was for me. So when I went on my visit to Texas A&M, they stuck me with two of the biggest party boys on the whole team and they showed me the time of my life to the point of where I'm in the back of the Uber and I'm I'm sick. (laughs) Like I had too many shots. I am lit off my ass. And I remember being in this Uber and being like, man, I got to throw up. I cannot let these guys see any sign of weakness. So I just remember being like, all right, I'm going to see you boys later. I'll see you in the morning. And I don't even make it to my room. I don't even make it back to the room. You know, my family were in these joined rooms at this hotel and college station, the Hilton. And they wake up the next day and I'm just outside the door, just. And that, to me, I woke up the next day, they're kind of pushing me. I'm like, success. <laughs> I'm alive. I'm good. <laughs> and I'm sitting going to meet Coach Sherman at this taco place, Fuego. <coughs> and I roll in probably 10 minutes late, and he looks at me, and I'm just white as a ghost. And Coach Sherman had been with Brett Favre in Green Bay. He knew what, he knew what he was knew up. He knew the signs. He knew what was up. And he was so good that he was just like, he knew, he knew when he put me with them two dudes from San Antonio, who I looked up to, it was on. And he had me. I'm in the boat. I'm in the boat. <laughs> when, when you go back and you mention your, your freshman year, where did you think you, you redshirted? What was it about that? Was it not being able to play as much as you thought you would? What transpired in Johnny's mind that kind of led him down the path of where he w- was with headed? Yeah, I just remember the first day going out to that first practice in the morning and you get like one rep as that like young kid right. who's there early. This is spring practice. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all the guys are getting done with the season. Then you're into spring. And I get that one rep and he's like, come back. And I'm like, seven step drop. And I let this ball go, Shannon. And it might have hit the top of the indoor. <laughs> this thing. And I remember Coach Sherman had his play sheet and he threw it down and he goes, what the fuck was that? <laughs> I'm nervous. These balls, Tannehill like these balls aired up like yeah. so rock hard. Right. I need that Brady. Yeah, you need a little, look, Give me a little grip it. cushion for the yeah, pushy yeah. is what we're going to say there, Shannon. <laughs> and that, my confidence, man. I went from Mr. Mr. Football at Texas to getting in here and being like, I don't throw it like Jamil Showers does. Right. The guy who was behind Tannehill. I don't throw it like him. That ball don't come out and <laughs> it don't come out like that with me. So then you start to see and you're comparing yourself to other people. And as that year went on, you know, being the bottom of the barrel guy, you know, being the guy that is getting ragged on by the seniors and this, and I'm traveling, like I'm quiet. I don't talk much. I kind of stay in my lane. I don't ask questions. I ain't trying to better myself at that point. Right. I'm just losing confidence week by week and just kind of like getting to the point where I'm like lost. Is football what I really like? Right. 
And that question was in my life from that point on. Wow. So from that point on, you always question whether the importance of football or ability. Ab- I was about to take is Johnny. Does he possess the ability to be what many believe he can be? Uh, so you had self doubt. I had self doubt for sure. I had self doubt, and I didn't get self assurance of myself and what I was as a football player until Cliff Kingsbury walked in my life. And a funny story about Cliff Kingsbury that I tell to everybody, we've been locked in like this since the first day I ever met him. Kerrville, Texas is 40 miles an hour, you know, away from San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So Cliff Kingsbury's at the University of Houston with Coach Sumlin, has Case Keenum there, obviously. Another real Texas high school football legend. Mm -hmm. And... Seven o'clock, our practice starts in Kerrville. We ran a very military drill style of football program right. with values and a lot of what we talk about at Texas A&M was how my high school football program was. So Kingsbury comes out in the field that first morning and I'm getting ready to warm up and he comes up to me and he dabs me up and he goes, what's up, bro? I uh, just want to keep it a buck with you. I don't have any scholarships to give you. But every single coach that I walk into a building in San Antonio, Texas, said you need to get your ass in the car and come down here and watch this kid practice. So he goes, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I just want to let you know I'm here to watch you ball out for a practice. And one day our paths will cross again. And I'm nervous. This is Cliff Kingsbury who played at Texas Tech. This is another legend in my Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, he was records. a real guy. Yeah. He wouldn't know whatever you want to say, but he was him yeah. at one point in time. And I didn't know the significance of what that talk as a high school kid was going to lead to being on a stage in New York four years later, Mm -hmm. three years later. But he kept it real with me like that. I was like, yo, I can't take you, but I'm here to watch you ball. Wow. And after that meet, and after the day of the workout, he just sitting over there on the side and he just gives me one of these like, you crush that. If you would have set out your entire season as a freshman, do you think you would have learned your lesson? Ooh. Um, no, I think it took me having the biggest fear of my entire life, failure, come to fruition. And failure wouldn't have happened for me if I didn't get to the success that I got. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yes. Do you think they would have disciplined you? Um, I think they could have. I think what I was doing in the off season and what I was doing in my workouts and who I was as a team leader, right. coming back with the Heisman Trophy, they should have benched me. They should have suspended me. But what I was doing, hey, you can't smoke weed. <laughs> Man, give me the fattest, dude. Give me the fattest what you got, Talk bro. about it. It's about a box of white out white grapes. We ain't even <laughs> slowing down nothing over here. This is what we're doing. And like from that, Okay, so you win the Heisman. Yeah. We come back. We play Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl. Smash it. Smack. Okay. After that, that night after the game is the infamous sparklers in the mouth with the Dom and the Burberry scarf. Yeah. Right after. This is where, like, it starts. And it's like, we just smacked our old rival in the Big 12 and Jerry World in front of 105. Right. On New Year's Day. This is where the ego, this is where the... You know, this is where you shift from, you know, Johnny Manziel into Johnny football, the little transition. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it's Mr. It's Johnny football. Yeah. And, and now there's no more self-doubt. Because now there's you- no more self-doubt because I know what I'm doing in practice. I know what I'm doing when I see cover two and I'm the whole shot. I'm toying with them in practice. They're mad. They, I mean, the only thing they have on me in practice in the setting that I'm seeing, the live rep, bullets, fire is they can't tell when a sack happens in practice because we ain't sacking people. Right. And you know in a game, you know, practice I'm running and give somebody a little move and I'm just looking at him like, ain't no way you making that tackle on the field, buddy. You can hop and hoop around and do your whole defensive thing (laughs) all you want. But you know out there under them lights, that ain't going to happen, brother. It ain't going to, it's not going to happen. Right. And that's not me speaking out of my ass. I I got film. Right. You know, I got I got stuff to show you that like I wasn't what I was more than what you thought I was, especially as a running quarterback. John, I led the SEC. Wow. Fourteen hundred yards rushing in my freshman year. Wow. It's documented. 
The first freshman in NCAA history to pass for 3,000 yards and carry and rush for 1,000 yards in the same season. The first player to pass for 300 yards and rush for 100 yards in the same game three times. Broke Archie Manning's 43-0 record for 500 in total yards of, set, of a total offense with 576. Owns all these freshmen's record. 11-2, and two, ranked number five, best since 1956. Beat Oklahoma 41-13 in the Cotton Bowl. Produced 516 yards of offense, four touchdowns, with a record 229 yards rushing. When you look, when you, do you understand at the time what you're actually doing? Um, when the ESPN Heisman list came out about week eight, nine, is when I started to kind of see like, whoa, because this is, you know, my life growing up with my boys was NCAA football, the video game, the road to glory, the road to the Heisman creating a player and being able to go do these things, pick your school, go to the, you know, do all of that. And now I'm living it. Right. So the focus doesn't shift to like getting the Heisman. It just focuses on like taking this team to heights that we haven't been before. Mm -hmm. And when you walk into Tuscaloosa, Alabama and do what happened that day, something that leaves a legacy, what, 2012, it's 2012 years later, mm -hmm. where I walk down the street every day of my life and somebody comes up and dabs me up and goes, 15 and a half point underdogs, Alabama, I'll never forget that day for the rest of my life. That's what kind of impact that day had on college football. And I hear it every day, see it every day. You see Alabama on the schedule uh, and you're on the Heisman watch list. You mentioned your 15 point underdogs and you understand what Alabama is. That's Coach Saban. You know the, the dogs that he has on that roster. You know the dogs that he sends to the NFL every year, multiple. What's going through your mind? Do you ever think, man, if I can go to Alabama, if I can go to Tuscaloosa and beat Bama, ooh, they got to take notice. Can't think like that. Can't think like that and be successful because you're putting pressure on yourself that's unneeded. Okay. I got 95% of the country that's saying Alabama's going to beat us. What do we have to lose? Right? I remember being on the bus on the way of the game and putting on the movie 300. This part comes on where it's give to them nothing but take from them. Every single thing, everything. And that was my mindset going into the game that like everybody in this stadium expects you to lose. Everybody in this state is rooting against you. Mm -hmm. We got maybe 20, 30,000 loyal Aggies scattered through about in the stands. We already lost two games that year. Right. What's the third gonna do? You know, we're out of the SEC title. We're out of, you know, the national championship conversation. Let's just try and go ball. And Cliff Kingsbury put together an unbelievable game plan for us offensively that highlighted our strengths, that kept us from being too vulnerable in a defense like that. And for the first half of that game, they don't know what the fuck is going on. We're running option with go routes and all. We are just unleashing the Cliff Kingsbury like creativeness mm -hmm. of a football playbook for an air raid. You know, this wasn't old Mike Leach air raid. This wasn't anything that Lincoln was doing wherever. This was just its own subtle thing, our own you know, particular thing right. that was tailored to me being able to run the ball the way that I could, as well as having an unbelievable like offensive line to be able to handle what they were throwing right. at us. Luke Jokel, Jake Matthews, Cedric Aboya, these are all first round picks mm -hmm. in the NFL and some really, really solid players. Right. Wow, well, I forgot you guys had that kind of offensive line. Yep. So that's why they were able to hold up. Jokel was the number two pick in the draft. I think Jake Matthews was a, top, was a top 10 pick in the draft. You guys were loaded. Mike Evans, Swoops was very underrated. Mike Evans, and that's somebody that, man, what a brother to me, man. It makes me even emotional even think about it. We got to come in at the same time in red shirt. And that red shirt year, we were tearing their ass up on the scout team. <laughs> so much that I went to my locker one day later in the year and they took my red jersey so they couldn't hit me, and they put a black jersey on me to be able to smack me in practice because me and Mike were doing we're our thing. We were doing our, we were starting that recipe of that pot, <laughs> and we were starting to cook. And then as that year goes on, that red shirt freshman year that we play together, you start to see a kid who's like a man amongst boys out there, and like really six five mm -hmm. with that frame. Like he was always what he was. But that confidence that started to grow in him, me and him had this telepathy. Same way you probably had with a quarterback back in the day where it's just like, that was a route. Right.
quick, easy. He knew everything. And me and him had that relationship that was like special, special. Wow. And it'll never be taken from us. You know, I can sit here and talk to him and still do the same signals as 12 years later. I can throw a peace sign, he's gonna go to the crib. Right. Is what that means <laughs> every time. So, you know, to have a special bond with somebody like that, that kid, that guy, that man, means the, means the fucking world to me. When Alabama started to come back, you looked at reporter and you said, F Alabama, F Saban, and that you were going to score. Why were you so confident? Why? Because Al the crowd, the crowd had gotten back in it. They're going haywire, defense, just freshman. Why were you so confident that you was going to get this football and you were going to go down the field and score? Yeah, well, the first, you know, half of that game, you know, first quarter, we're up 20 to nothing. So that stadium, you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. And Tuscaloosa doesn't get like that very much, if ever. Um, I mean, you can count on both your hands how many times they've lost since 2010, mm -hmm. for the most part. Yes. Um, so confidence in what we were doing, you know, our we lost our first game of the year to Florida. Mm -hmm. Cool, first game of the year, whatever. Then we get up on LSU and we end up blowing that game where I feel like we really should have won. That was our turning point in the season. So after that, we started to get together and come together that we didn't want to be, you know, the weak link of this team. We needed that offense and who we had to be the catalyst, to be the center point of that team. And we needed our defense just to kind of hold on. So as much as the Tuscaloosa and the Alabama game is about me and the offense, it's not the way I look at it. Our defense got multiple stops, got a pick late on like the last drive is there on the eight yard line to right. go in and take the lead. Mm -hmm. That changes things. We get a pick, we get the ball out, and then there's 50 seconds left in the game. We are on like third and seven, Saban has a timeout. We run a run play, we get like four, we're backed up on our own 20. So it's punt time. Now we're gonna punt it to who, I mean, could have been, it could have been Amari Cooper, whoever they had back there was a menace. And we had put this play in all week of a special teams punt scenario where we go on the hard count. It's third and four. We go hard count, they jump, we touch them, first down, mic drop. So you have your offense, what we did in the first half. We scored 20 in the first quarter. Right. We only scored nine the rest of the game. We're hanging on for dear life. Mm -hmm. You know, the plays that we made on that one score drive, you know, the six points we scored in the second half mm -hmm. was off a turnover, wheel route down the sideline, dime, corner route, next play, dime. Two plays, touchdown, like very opportunistic and going with the flow of the game. And then you seal the game with a special teams play. So you got offense, defense, special teams. We walk into the locker room in Tuscaloosa and we burn that thing down. Total team win. Total, completely. Without a doubt, total team win. If they have the college football playoff in 2011, you guys have to, and A&M gets it. Do you believe y'all win the national championship? We got to play Bama again, probably. So that's <laughs> another, like, knock it out. I, I think we have a very good chance. Right. I think we got better and even from the Tuscaloosa game, the Alabama game, up until the Cotton Bowl. The Cotton Bowl was our best showing of the entire year. Yeah, oh, yeah. Y'all put it together, man. Yeah, and we did. And that's mm -hmm. just where our, like, that was the pinnacle of what our team was that year. And we mm -hmm. showed it at the last game on the biggest stage. Want to join Club Shay Shay? Become an official member by hitting that subscribe button where you never know who's going to be joining us for drinks and conversation. Don't be late to the party because you know we like to do something before two something.